Well, thank you very much, Kevin. It's, uh, it's a joy to participate in this symposium. As you've already said, Spark has had a very important role in uh, uh, doing what uh, some of my early work was different from, and that's focusing on direct patient benefits. And I've learned an enormous amount uh, considering how low I started my knowledge of translational medicine. It has truly been enormous. There was a, a big gap, uh, and, I, and I appreciate that, and uh, congratulate Spark on this occasion. The project that uh, I began as a Spark Eon uh, is uh, what uh, we call the NERITAS project. It stands for Nucleotide Repeat Disease. And these are the participants at Stanford. It's not a large group of my lab that's focused on this. We've done this as a mom and pop shop, sort of, uh, with a collaboration of Murda Chamlu, a neuroscientist collaborator in some of the animal studies, and with uh, Tzu Hao Cheng, uh, who is a molecular biologist who's currently at National Yaming University in Taiwan. And these people are part of a multi-laboratory project, which I may have time to say a little bit about, on ALS, really, honchoed by Aaron Gittler and Len Petricelli. Uh, the translational part of the work was very directly due to my involvement with uh, SPARC and the support of SPARC and Spectrum. Uh, it led to an NIH R01 grant, which surprisingly I received at an advanced age, so I guess there is no age discrimination at the NIH that's received support from the something we've already heard about, OTL and the Stanford Innovation Program, and some support from my KT Lee professorship. Importantly, the SPARC Ad Advisory Committee, Daria, Kevin, Bruce Koch, uh, Mark Smith, Steve Scow, and already mentioned the Harrington Discovery Institute, which has uh, supported some of the work uh, through uh, its advisory team in a Scholar Innovator Award. So this is just a photo of uh, Tzu Hao Johnny, a collaborator in all of the work I'll talk about. And I'm going to be talking about Huntington's disease as a model system for nucleotide repeat diseases. And let me tell you what they are. All of us contain in our genomes a Huntington gene. And in that, uh, near the five prime end, or beginning of that gene, is a repeat of the nucleotides CAG, 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 CAG. And in most of us, the repeats are relatively short, maybe 30, 35 in length, maybe 20, 25. But in some individuals, this series of CAGs expands in length. And this expansion is inherited. And once it's occurred, uh, the offspring of the individuals in which it's occurred inherit that expansion. And that leads, because it's in the protein coding region of the gene, to abnormal proteins. And the protein that CAG uh, encodes for, or the amino acid, is glutamine. So in these proteins are long stretches of polyglutamines, or poly-Q, which is the code for glutamine. This leads to the normal protein, the normal Huntington protein in most of us is soluble and functional, but when these polyglu regions expand, the proteins misfold, they form aggregates, uh, and particularly in the brain and nervous system, the, uh, the neurodegeneration occurs. This is a normal brain. This is a brain cross-section from a Huntington's patient. And the nervous system, the cells die. This leads to involuntary or chorea-form movements. They're called mental deterioration and in inevitable death. Now, these are incurable diseases. And there are, uh, there are a number. This is the Huntington's in which the CAG is in the Huntington's gene. In uh, other instances, there are related diseases in which there's a CAG expansion in the ataxin-1 gene, which leads to spinocerebellar ataxia type 1, and there are a whole series of genes. What's important to know here is each of these is an inherited monogenic disease. It's caused by expression of a mutant protein encoded by a single gene. Uh, containing the expansion. So unlike the neurodegeneration that occurs in some diseases, as has already been pointed out, there are many causes of, of dementia or what has been perhaps 
uh, group together as Alzheimer's disease, uh, in which there are multiple causes. In this instance, for each disease, it's a monogenic, it's a single uh, uh, gene abnormality. The mechanism is the same for all of the diseases, and the mutation is dominant, which means that when an individual acquires the mutated gene, half of his or her offspring have the opportunity to acquire that gene, and it's dominant over the normal gene. So in these families that are affected by these diseases, uh, the devastation comes from having seen one's parents' brains deteriorate and knowing that if they have the abnormality, which is easy to diagnose through standard methods by taking a little bit of a cheek pouch scraping and determining uh, whether the, the uh, CAG is expanded or not expanded in the individual. They know with certainty or without if they're not, whether or not they're going to have the disease and if they're going to have the disease approximately because it varies with the length of the repeat, approximately the age in which it's uh, going to occur. So many of these individuals really, uh, children of Huntington's patients, for example, uh, don't decide personally not to go ahead and have a test done. Now, we are celebrating today the enormous success of SPARC. And one point that sort of has not been mentioned uh, too intently is uh, that part of the success of SPARC, I believe, is because they've chosen SPARC-E's uh, very carefully. And then SPARC is based on the principle that the uh, SPARC projects, although they're translational in nature, applied in nature, are based on a solid scientific foundation, which is what we heard in all of these SPARC-E talks earlier. And I'm reminded of that context of the statement by the famous Argentinian physiologist Bernardo who say there's no applied science if there's no science to apply. And that is really what has happened in SPARC. Uh, uh, they, they've applied science and encouraged uh, the strength of the science that they're going to apply. Now, in my instance, for as a Spark E, uh, my Spark project began as a result of basic research, and this is just something everyone knows about, the basic uh, central dogma of molecular biology, that DNA is transcribed into RNA, which is translated into an amino acid chain and folds into a protein. And one aspect of the transcription aspect of DNA into RNA is a process called uh, RNA elongation. As the RNA polymerase moves along the template, uh, the bubble which contains the polymerase uh, really makes an RNA chain which comes out of the bubble. And the process of, this, of the RNA chain getting longer and longer as the polymerase moves along the gene is called transcription elongation. And there are proteins that bind when we're known to bind to RNA polymerase that facilitate that transcription elongation and keep the uh, RNA on the, on the template through, the, keeps the RNA polymerase rather, on the template during the process. Now, the observation that uh, led to the SPARC project uh, was really one that my colleagues and I published in Cell several years ago, and that's that a transcription elongation protein, SPT4, which in, is a yeast protein, but in mammalian cells it's known as SUPT4H, is required selectively for transcription through extended nucleotide repeats. That means when the abnormal uh, A CAG expansion occurs, uh, as you'll see in a moment, uh, there are problems for the polymerase to proceed through those, and it, uh, uh, it's kept on by SPT4, and I'll explain that further. So let me tell you just what SPT4 is. It's a transcription elongation protein that binds to another uh, protein, SPT5, and that complex binds to RNA polymerase. And as the, uh, and that uh, allows the RNA polymerase to form a clamp on the template. And that's, that's important to the process of making these abnormal gene products. 
Ordinarily, when the polymerase proceeds through an expanded repeat region, these repeats cause the polymerase to pause, and it would otherwise fall off if it were for, not for SPT4, SPT5 complex, which allows the polymerase to stay clamped on. So what happens normally is the polymerase proceeds through these abnormal genes and makes these harmful products, these abnormal proteins that form aggregates and precipitates in the brain. And what we found in this report that we published several years ago is that if one uh, genetically deletes SPT4 or interferes with its function in some other way, when the polymerase encounters these elongated repeats, it pauses and instead of staying on and then going on to make the abnormal gene product, it falls off. So the loss of the function of this complex results in less poly-Q, abnormal protein, and decreased aggregation. And we showed in that paper that it wasn't just applicable to CAG repeats, but applicable to other nucleotide repeats, trinucleotide repeats and repeats of other nucleotides in genes, and they could be in the coding region, protein coding region, or other regions of gene. So the key findings in the paper were three, that this complex is selectively required to transcribe specifically through expanded repeats, it has little or no effect on normal genes, we, we found that a point mutation that interferes with the interaction mimics the effect of genetic deficiency. And as I've already said, if you have a deficiency of this transcription elongation factor, it decreases the mutant protein aggregation. So the eureka moment that led to the translational or applied aspects of this uh, project was the question, can we develop a therapeutic for Huntington's disease and other inherited diseases caused by expression of genes containing repeat expansions? And uh, to begin to look at that, uh, we've heard about the, the view that animal models are needed. Well, the Huntington's animal model is a lousy animal model. The repeats have to be uh, expanded to 100 repeats or longer to be abnormal. There are other problems, but everyone expects you to do an animal model. And we did an animal model with knocking Huntington's gene. These models were available. They were made by others. And uh, uh, in this, we reported the results that we could show that knockdown of the gene either genetically by knocking out one of the two alleles, uh, the, a double knockout is not viable, it's an embryonic lethal in mice, or by using antisense oligos, we could uh, diminish the performance deficit in these mice and extend the lifespan. So that gave us, despite the poor uh, general views that I have about the animal model. It gave us some uh, notion that we can go ahead. And the SPARC project goals were then to establish and validate assays for screening agents that target SPT4 functions, to identify the hit compounds, and to develop one or more of these compounds as a possible therapeutic agent in Huntington's disease and maybe in other diseases. And the people that largely carried out this work in my lab were on the initial list. Yan'an Feng, senior research scientist in my lab, and Ning Deng, a research associate in genetics. Now, as a geneticist, I can tell you that there are three very important factors in gene discovery, and I found that they're the same important factors in drug discovery, and it's kind of real, it's like real estate, but different factors. The three most important factors in drug discovery are assay, assay, assay. And so the uh, goal was then to develop an assay that would work to reliably and uh, consistently identify the compounds we wanted. And in a word, we did this by attaching subunits of the Gaussian luciferase, one to SPT4, SPT4H, the other to the segment of SPT5 that interacts with it and show that when these two things interact with each other to form the complex, the luciferase subunits interact and we get a signal. And if we put a point mutation in SPT5 component or the SPT4 component, we can interfere with the signal. So we went ahead and set up a high throughput screen again, uh, something that Stanford uh, uh, is able to offer now for 
academic scientist in which we put in both of these genes, we induce them, we look for small molecule inhibitors that interfered with the interaction and uh, in the same way that we could interfere it genetically, and we did a screening of 130,000 compounds here and did various controls and eventually worked it down to uh, 30 compounds, which were given HD numbers. And we had multiple problems during the screening procedures, and these required solutions. And the Spark advisors were central in helping guys like us who were not at all experienced in these methods or approaches to proceed through this project. And it ha if it hadn't been for the advisory committee, and especially from Bruce Cook, whose advice was, was uh, absolutely essential to proceeding on this, uh, finding things that we never imagined, I think, listening to Ben uh, talk about the problems that were uh, not imaginable in advance, like uh, the stability of the reagents under chosen assay conditions, the amounts of the inducer, the timing of the manipulations of reagent addition, the technical reproducibility. This is a, <coughs> Uh, this is uh, uh, results from whether or not you uh, freeze and thaw the cells to lyse them in a wet stage or after you spin them down, uh, a wet stage and a dry stage. And we found in the course of this, with the help of the advisors, that nothing is trivial in high throughput screening. Now, our collaborator, Su Hao, had a, a very similar assay using fluorescent protein instead of luciferase. And all of the hits that we identified in that assay were confirmed in his assay and vice versa. So we ended up with a, a group of hit compounds. And this is just one of them, uh, HD101, in which one can see there's a, uh, with, uh, uh, there, there's interference with a luciferase signal. And this is just a toxicity curve uh, measured by MTT assays, or in this instance, an ATP assay. And one can see that there's a therapeutic window. And we went ahead, and again, with the help of advisors, and particularly Murdad in, in this case, as a collaboration, we tested these compounds. And we uh, won't go into details, but made a pro-drug uh, uh, the metabolite HD101 is a metabolite of a compound we have a, a, as a prodrug, show that it gets into the brain, it's transported across the blood-brain barrier, and we did uh, simple preliminary pharmacokinetic studies, again with the help of advisors, and we had a, additional leads that came out of our high throughput screening, and this just shows the dose dependence. And this just shows that in addition to the luciferase assays, in this instance, it's possible to know uh, specifically whether the causal agent of the disease, namely the abnormal protein, is being uh, reduced. In this instance, lymphoblastoid cells were obtained from a Huntington's patient. It makes a, uh, a normal protein from the normal copy of the gene and an abnormal elongated protein from the abnormal copy. And this is just to show an SPT4H is knocked down, the abnormal uh, protein is affected, but not the normal protein. And there were a number of patents that were uh, applied for, and there are three patents issued, both to National uh, Yaming University and Stanford uh, covering this research. There are additional patents issued in, in Europe and Asia. Uh, and uh, there are also additional uh, intellectual property that's in process of uh, uh, patent applications have been submitted. Now, I do want to take a minute or two to say something about how one determines whether a treatment benefits a patient having Huntington's disease. And it depends uh, what you call Huntington's disease. I think when I gave a SPARC seminar a few months back, uh, uh, Carol Karp said that uh, uh, there, uh, there are over 100 studies. I was pointed out there were 100 studies uh, in which there uh, clinical studies and clinical uh, uh, studies.gov site for Huntington's disease, but it depends how you're defining the disease. 
if the clinical definition of Huntington's disease is an inherited disease characterized by involuntary movements, et cetera. The pathological definition of the disease is neurodegeneration resulting from production of an abnormal protein in brain cells. And the important thing to note is that the clinical symptoms are not the disease. They are, to use the expression that's been uh, talked about this afternoon, biomarker surrogates of the disease. Because the symptoms, symptom improvement may occur in the absence of any effect on the neurodegeneration. So how do you measure the effect of an agent on neurodegeneration? Well, the only rigorous way I know of in clinical studies is to take the patient's brain out before and after you, you give them a drug. Obviously, that's not a very practical way of doing a clinical study. And the approach that the, at Spark has helped us significantly in thinking this through, and we've talked this through. Uh, for these monogenic diseases, we suggest that the approach for evaluating the efficacy of a treatment is to look for things that affect the causal agents and the causal agents' actions in patients. Uh, that uh, to show that the causal agent, namely the abnormal protein, is reduced is at least as valid an approach, we, we suggest, uh, than uh, uh, measuring uh, clinical symptoms. And this really relates to some of the points that we've just heard uh, uh, Janet Woodcock make. Uh, OK, so how does one what, how does one assay the production of the causal agent? There's not a, time, a lot of time to go into this, but we can measure, as one of my slides showed, a reduction of the mutant protein in lymphoblastoids and blood cells from patients. Uh, the protein, abnormal protein, can be measured in cerebral spinal fluid. And there are also ancillary tests, which are true biomarkers that can be used in addition to the causal agent. And one of these is a, is a uh, ancillary test that Daria and, um, and uh, Murdad and their colleagues have been important in putting forth, and that's uh, the inhibition of mitochondrial function, which is a, 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 a good biomarker surrogate on the basis of their work and others for the effects of Huntington's disease. Now, there are a number of FDA programs applicable to the agent that we are trying to develop fast track breakthrough therapy, accelerated approval and priority review. And unfortunately, the nature of the disease is such uh, and the uh, impact of a uh, functional drug that may benefit patients with the disease is significant that uh, any agent would qualify for all of these uh, programs. Now, I should say in the last couple of minutes that uh, there are other nucleotide repeat diseases in addition to these poly-Q diseases. And in that instance, the diseases is not uh, where the repeat, in that instance, the repeat is not in the protein coding region of the gene, but can be in the non-coding regions of the uh, RNA or, uh, or in an intron. And one of those is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis the inherited form of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is a fraction of ALS patients in which there is an expansion not of a trinucleotide repeat, but a hexanucleotide repeat, GGGGCC, uh, which uh, makes an abnormal toxic RNA. And there's some evidence that even part of the toxicity is due to dipeptides encoded by the opposite strand, but that's too complicated to go into now, but it, this is a uh, nucleotide repeat disease. There's also a subset of fragile X patients. Uh, in the classical fragile X, the repeats are expanded to 1,000 nucleotides. Uh, repeats in this instance, they're just 50 to 200, and it can produce tremor ataxia. There are certain types of muscular dystrophy, and a couple of months ago, uh, the group I've mentioned to you, which was led by Aaron and Len, and we were part of that multi-lab study, reported that SPT4 selectively re re regulates the expression of this uh, uh, C9-ORF72 locus, sense and anti-sense mutant transcripts. So the same is really true 
uh, of uh, this disease as we had shown for Huntington's disease. And also we have unpublished data showing the same is true for SCA3, one of these spina cerebellar ataxias, and I expect it's going to be true of uh, the rest of these uh, repeat diseases as well. I expect one never knows until you do the experiment, but the uh, science behind it is such that I'd be willing to say with a, a high degree of anticipation that it's going to affect these other diseases. So this is a term that I didn't know much about before I became a Sparky, and the importance of a target product profile. So what is the target product profile of what we're trying to develop? We're looking for a small molecule that interferes with the SPT4-5 interaction. That's been done. It decreases the mutant abnormal protein. It's been done. It passes through the blood-brain barrier. It's been done for some of our leads. Uh, it has acceptable pharmacokinetic properties and acceptable toxicity. I've put done for subleads. It depends how one defines acceptable, and acceptable by whom and uh, to whom. But uh, remember, these are devastating diseases in which uh, uh, possibly the standards for acceptability may be different from treating a disease where there are other treatments out there and uh, where the consequences of the disease are not so devastating. We've shown this uh, for it has, uh, this was optional to our original TPP, that it has effects against other diseases. We've shown that, published that for ALS, and not published yet for SCA3. And uh, then there needs to be assays, uh, which are done now in our labs, mainly lab-grade assays, uh, in which one can assay the reduction of the mutant gene product, the causal agent, and also the ancillary assays. The uh, crucial question is, will the FDA affect the, uh, accept these kinds of biochemical results in lieu of the traditional way of symptom assessment as demonstration of efficacy? Okay, so uh, this is the original project goal, and it's morphed uh, with the help of the Spark program into a company uh, which has acquired the same name, Naritas Inc., and the slogan for the company uh, was suggested by another Spark advisor, uh, Roxanne Duan, targeting the cause of nucleotide repeat diseases. My general view of scientific projects uh, sort of parallels what Yogi Berra, I think, once said, that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And uh, we haven't, I haven't viewed things as being broken. Frankly, it was, despite all the encouragement of Spark, was reluctant to start a company. Uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, it got to a point where there are too many compounds and too many diseases, and it seems the real way to get this into patients most quickly is to have done this, and that is now happening. And in the last slide, I want to say thanks to Spark and its advisors who have helped to translate these very basic research findings into uh, what may be hope for patients afflicted with these diseases. And particularly to the Spark advisory committee that I want to mention again, Daria, Kevin, Bruce, Mark, and Steve. I thank you very much. Everyone wants to go for a reception. But if you would have any. Do we have any questions? Sorry to keep you all away from drinks, but um, um, the the long terminal repeats are, are there for a reason. They're 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 excessively long in disease, but they're the, the repeats are there for a reason. And I wonder if your drugs have any kind of a toxic effect because they might foreshorten the translation at that early. Okay, that so early we don't affect the repeats themselves. Right. We affect the, the products of the genes. And, but your point's very well taken. I don't think anyone really knows why the repeats are there in the normal length in, in our genes. Uh, we've looked at uh, not, uh, we haven't done uh, extensive, although we've done now some, 
uh, RNA-seq studies, and we've looked at effects of the overall gene expression, and uh, the SUPT4 knockdown does not have material effects on the, uh, and that's published in our cell paper, uh, on the uh, expression of other genes in the genome. Uh, one doesn't, I, I mean, that's one measurement of material effects, right? right? right. Uh, the way we're going to have to find out is, is by doing the studies in patients as, as well. But, but yes, uh, and we, we hope to be able to proceed to do that. But what the consequences of interfering with translation, uh, uh, it's, a more, it's a complicated answer. Uh, we know <coughs> that the mechanism that distinguishes between expanded repeats and normal repeats is dose dependent. The longer the repeat, the easier it is to distinguish and knock down that selectively oh, wow. at a given dose than it is if the repeat is only expanded to 40 to 50. It's harder for the mechanism to distinguish between that and a repeat of 25. As the repeats get longer and longer, it uh, becomes easier to distinguish between, but, but uh, and, and we have to, it's, my guess is, and it's just a guess, is that it's all going to be dose related. Uh, and that it, uh, we, we already know, well, we've, we've done dosage effects and we've shown what I've just told you, but uh, it should be practical to find a dose that will affect for any given patient the abnormal gene, but not the normal one. So it's sort of like precision medicine yeah. in one yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah, sure exactly. And, and then just another quick question. Um, in your animal studies, have you ever tried providing your inhibitor to establish disease? And did you notice any disaggregation of the Huntington gene at that point? Okay. Uh, we haven't, but it's been published by uh, others, uh, uh, the people from a company with the unfortunate name of ISIS that changed it to Ionis. And uh, uh, they, uh, they may have made and published antisense against the Huntington protein, uh, Huntington gene itself. And in that instance, they're, in fact, they're trying to develop a, a therapy for that using antisense oligos that have to be injected into the brain into the intrathecal space, and they're now beginning, according to a report at the uh, CHDI conference uh, last earlier this year, uh, they're beginning phase one clinical studies in England where they are injecting this intrathecally. That shows you how desperate these patients are. So a small molecule would, would clearly be better than this, this approach. And in their instance, in mouse studies that they've published, they can show that there's, it's a reversible complex that they can get improvement and reversible, but we haven't done such experiments. TC, last question. Yeah, so I might have missed this. Um, clearly, your compounds will reduce the total HET uh, long protein, um, but does it increase the proportion of the s shorter soluble forms of the protein, HET protein? And would that uh, actually affect the dynamics of aggregation? Okay, so <laughs> you ask a very complicated and good question. What happens is that uh, uh, the, and we've published this also in our cell paper, that the uh, aggregating abnormal gene product can co, and actually it was observed even before we published that, can co-aggregate with a normal uh, product okay. so that when we reduce the abnormal protein, uh, we can increase the solubilization of the normal protein by that act as well. So, so, I, so there are specific assays to look at both soluble and yes, well, there, okay. there are antibodies that recognize the abnormal protein and uh, uh, the expanded repeat region, and there and there are other antibodies that recognize epitopes that are present in both proteins. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your work. So you can distinguish that. In one of the slides, I said I went over that too quickly, but that's what we used in that. Okay. 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 Thank you very much, Stan. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.